Ladies and gentlemen, my friends across the globe, today is the day, the big dual box set release day from BMG. We have, of course, the Everyday Rocks box set and the Choices box set. Both are available. Links are in the show notes. Congratulations, guys. This is a, a pretty monumentous occasion. I don't know of any time uh, there may have been where multiple box sets were released on the same day from the same band. But BMG has worked really hard along with Uriah Heap and management to get this whole thing together, to get it out to you guys. And I can tell you, these are both very cool projects. If you haven't seen it, I did a release or an unboxing video for the Everyday Rocks box set. And you can check that out. The links are in the show notes. But congratulations to Uriah Heap and to BMG for this collaboration. It's pretty spectacular. And now on with the show. Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing. Hello and welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, bringing you this fan-based but band-endorsed podcast, going through every single song in the Uriah Heap recorded album, bonus tracks, and all that catalog. Having a lot of fun with this, guys. You know, especially uh, seeing the band turn in a, in a huge direction towards where they are currently in real time, adding two more members um, that uh, are, are currently with the band. Actually, as I'm recording this, are working in the recording studio on their 25th studio album, which I'm very excited about. I love to live in the dream. I think where they are right now as musicians, as, as both writers and performers are, are just, you know, top peak. So very, very anxious to see how this new album is going to turn out. I'm sure it's going to be wonderful. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But while they're doing that, we're still catching up to where they are currently. We're on season 17, going through the songs of the album Raging Silence, where we've had a couple of band member changes. Phil Lanzen and Bernie Shaw have joined the band. They are currently in the band now. So we have made a uh, another 40% turn towards the current lineup. And there we are. So the song that we have today is called Voice on My TV. You know, and that that just immediately conjures images to me of people like Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, uh, Billy Graham, Jimmy Swaggart, you know, these these people that uh, try and get you to give money to them based on your religious preferences, the fear that they put into you of, of uh, God's love and stuff like that. Um, I actually interviewed Steve Peters, who was interviewed by Tammy Faye Baker uh, many years ago in a very famous interview. And he was a really nice guy. He said Tammy Faye was, was absolutely wonderful. Um, just not really knowledgeable about uh, the topic that they were talking about, but was really open to his thoughts, which was kind of surprising because they were uh, very damning people. You know, you need to think like we think and you need to think like we're telling you God wants you to think. So those are the images that just that title invokes for me. There's a little inflection of that in the lyrics, but we'll find out if I'm right about the subject matter of the actual song or not. Here it is by Uriah Heep. Voice on my TV from the album Raging Silence. Friends, this positive, possibility-filled telecast of television ministry to the world is brought about by the generous support and donations by friends just like you. <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> exactly where I was, uh, where I was thinking my mind went in the same direction as that opening. Really love that, uh, you know, the sound of the 
changing channels. It was back in those days too. We only had certain channels available to us. For those of you who are a little bit younger in the audience and may not have been around or aware of this, or some of us who have gone long out of our way to try and forget how we used to live, We used to have like three major networks in the States. It was ABC, NBC, and CBS. All the other stations on that main dial, I think there was, what, uh, 12 channels on the main dial, if I'm not mistaken. Um, But most of them were just fuzz. There was nothing there. And then um, the UHF dial, which had, I think, 61 or 74 channels. I can't remember now. Um, Most of those were also blank for us in, in Detroit. I think we had channel like 20 and channel 52 and a, and a few others. But if you wiggled the dial just right, sometimes you could get other channels, right? So you could you could just find that fine line where you could pick up another station. We had one where we saw uh, a station in Australia of all places, which is really weird because that's so far away. And we used to watch a show called Prisoner Cell Block H, which was rebooted by Netflix into Wentworth. But it was apparently this uh, very long running Australian soap opera. So I I love the sound of that, the changing channels, because I think it was sometime in the 80s when remotes started uh, becoming a thing. I can't remember exactly when that happened. But I remember like the old big console televisions that were more like a piece of furniture that sat on your floor and you could put a whole buffet on the top. And uh, but you had to get up to change the channel. I think once cable came out, um, I think that's when we had the remote that st- that actually controlled the cable box and not the television itself. But by then we had a lot more channels. So it was uh, it was very different, but that's actually what it would sound like. That was a great uh, reproduction of that. It would be, you know, you, you turn the knob, which was very loud and very hard to turn, and you would get fuzz, and then you would have to turn it again, and then you would get a station, and then the next one would be fuzz again. And, you know, it was it was a real thing. And whenever I hear phrases like the struggle was real, it, it really was. This is what we actually had to go through. And nowadays, you can just say it into your Alexa, and it'll change the channel for you. I mean, that's the, the tech we have now. But back then, uh, so that, that intro is actually uh, really nostalgic for me. I really like it. And uh, and it certainly, like I said, it went in the direction I was originally thinking just based on the title, because I'm not familiar with this song. So, uh, yeah, very cool connection just based on the title. I got so caught up in the nostalgia of the sound of turning television stations that I didn't even talk about the song. Uh, But after the intro, um, very nice, very gentle opening. Not what I would have expected after the last couple songs, but typically, you know, song two, song three or song four on an album, a band, especially around this time, was going to start slowing things down a little bit so that they could ramp up again. And uh, so that's in a way, it's not too surprising, but I like the sound of it. I like Bernie singing a little more gently. It's it's nice to hear. It's very pleasant sounding. Um, sometimes when you have those voices that are, are just really, you know, heavy and have that little bit of grit to them and that when they sing light, they don't always sing nice. But this is very nice. Ronnie James Dio was another one that, man, he could sing hard, but at the same time, he could do, you know, very gentle vocals like he did with Rainbow and and he did on the Butterfly Ball, just really unexpected. So it's nice to hear how Bernie sounds here in the in the early stages of the album, singing a little more gently. Love that burst of power there in the vocals. You know, it really feels like this is such a personal story that Bernie is telling us, and he didn't even write the song. That's the the strength of a really good singer, is somebody who can make you believe that they've experienced something that's never happened, or at least hasn't happened to them. Uh, But very cool. I love the layers of keyboards I'm hearing. I think I'm hearing two guitar tracks, though. I'm hearing a rhythm guitar slightly to the left, and then uh, more of an accent guitar track on the right. But uh, the drums are cutting through nicely. Uh, bass is, is there. It's a little hard to detect right now. I know that one of the guitar tracks is, is pretty much in the same pan as the vocals. So that's kind of burying things a little bit. But the performance is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's a very simple song at this point. But the sound of it, everything blended together is just really nicely layered.
I love the two keyboard tracks because you've got one that's playing uh, quarter notes and one that's playing eighth notes and they sound like they work together, but they kind of feel like they're a little bit opposing at the same time. It's actually very interesting. And that could just be the particular tones uh, or how long the quarter notes are sustained versus the eighth notes, which are a little more staccato. Um, very interesting, though. I, I really like the blend of it. And the bass cuts through a little bit more here. We can we can hear it. it, it it's not interestingly on this album, the bass isn't something that you notice as much as its as its presence. You don't really hear the notation as much as just you can hear the the low end in the song. It's really kind of weird. Um, I can hear certain notes come through, but for the majority of it, it's it's more just that the tone is there and present, thickening up the low end of the song as opposed to really hearing the dynamics of what he's playing. So uh, very strange. But in any case, the whole blend of it sounds pretty good. Uh, I'm liking the song. I like the tempo of it. It feels right. And uh, we'll see where it goes. So it may be a little bit hard to hear depending on your listening device or what, um, you know, what your audio setup is for listening to the show. Maybe if you listen to the uh, the album track directly, you might hear it a little bit better. But uh, there are some nice little dynamics that are be pl being played on the hi-hat by Lee Kerslake. And it's not quite on the beat. There's just a little accent here and there that makes that uh, verse part a little bit more interesting, too. It's basically in the center maybe slightly off the center to your left, just a tad. But that's pretty much where the hi-hat is. It's just very quiet in the mix. But it's some nice dynamics that are being played there. You know, I didn't mention it when we heard it the first time, but I love that backing vocal section right there where they're panning it uh, over to the right and then over to the left. It sounds very Beatlesque to me, maybe something around Magical Mystery Tour, but it, it really has a feeling that is a little different for Uriah Heep, but really sounds good. It's not something I would want to hear all the time. This is kind of like a, hey, what song do we want to use this one effect on that we've been dying to use? because we're not going to put it on every song or maybe any other song ever again. This is like a one shot thing that you would do. And uh, they picked a great song to do it on that misleading thing that we get from these religious icons that we were talking about um, really kind of plays into that motion of the backing vocals that I'm going to steer you in one direction and then pull you in another direction before you even know what's going on. Very common trick with those uh, with those folks. And I really like the way that that's represented here in the audio. I really like that. There's a feeling of like angelic voices in the deep background of all of that right there. And it, it feels like they're telling you, you know, different things because they're not popping up and speaking at the same time. I don't know. There's something really intriguing and mystical about that. And again, maybe it's just because of the theme of the song that I'm thinking about. But it really kind of gives again, it's, it's like that painted face on a clown. You know, the clown is not that happy 100 percent of the time he's at the party the face is painted on. You don't know what's really underneath of that face. And that is why I think people are, are afraid of clowns because it's a, it's a deception that's very much in front of your face. You know, the smile is painted on, it's not real. So we don't know whether this is someone we can actually trust or not. And uh, it, it was kind of the same in this situation too, in that those uh, keyboard sounds really brought that out very well. I really like that. And it's also very simple. You know, there's not a lot of different things going on to draw your attention. It's very specifically geared towards this. You get the, you know, you get the rhythm of the band so that that's not lost when the next part kicks in um, or during this part. But you also are 
directed and focused enough to kind of hear that weird uh, controlling angelic sound. I really like that. Four words, and they apply to the solo, but I think they apply to the song too, is that there's beauty in simplicity. You don't always have to have seven or eight different layers. You don't always have to play something flashy. You can just play something that's simple and really fits. I love that dual layering of the higher notes of the guitar. That sounded really good, very tasteful. Um, yeah, cool part. I really like the interplay here. You know, the the television itself having a voice, an actual voice in the song is pretty cool because it's not just an object that the singer is singing about. It's actually a character in the play of the song. I really like that. And I love that the singer or, or character that the singer is playing strikes back and, and, you know, yes, you're the voice, but I have control over you. I'm the one in, in power here. I really like that. Well, that wasn't a chilling end at all, was it? No. Wow, very cool ending, you know, and, and that is kind of the power that people or, or influencers can have over you. Now, you know, we're talking about television here in the in the late 80s, but you could also be talking about uh, the Internet, uh, TikTok, um, you know, any of these app, apps where you have uh, social media influencers or influencers of any kind that try to bully you into doing something, put fear in you so that you'll take a certain action and usually involves them getting your money or, you know, you doing something that furthers their cause or joining their numbers so that they get, you know, appear to be stronger. Um, you know, it's all a game, guys. It really is. So watch out for that kind of stuff. It's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. But this is a great song. Um, I like the fact that it had uh, just a nice, slightly up-tempo feel to it. I think there were a lot of good things in here, uh, a lot of subliminal stuff. Um, I heard uh, right in, in the uh, last part there before I am the voice on your TV, I heard someone say, can you hear me? Uh, just just thrown in in the right ear, just really subtle. Um, so a lot of, lot of little subtle things in there. But for the most part, the song is fairly straightforward and simple. And I like that. You know, you can have a wonderful song that's very simple and you could have a lot of wonderful songs that are multi-layered and have lots of different parts and things in them. I think this is a great song as it is. I wouldn't have wanted to add anything more to it, to be honest. Um, again, thinking about the time when this came out, it's very fitting of the era, but I like it. I really think it's a great song. And um, I, th I find it interesting that I connected with the subject matter just by reading the title. Um, very telltale without being telltale, I suppose. But anyway, guys, it's Friday. I hope that you have a great weekend, whatever you're doing, be safe, have fun, you know, be aware that we're still in the middle of some kind of crisis, no matter how many people are acting like we're not be safe. And we'll be here to talk about it tomorrow. Take care guys. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the magician's podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. 
please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.